um, which is uh, very similar to what we've been talking about before. Trophic levels are the feeding steps in the food chain. So we're talking about the steps. We're talking about from the grass to the grasshopper to the mouse to the snake. We're talking about the different feeding levels, the feeding steps in the food chain. A food chain represents only one possible route for the energy, for the transfer of energy in an ecosystem. All right, in the screen before, we looked at the grass and then that getting eat, eaten by the grasshopper and that getting eaten by the mouse and that getting eaten by the um, snake. But that's just one possibility. Let me ask you this. In nature, is there only one possibility for a food chain? No. All right, there, there's not just one food chain that you see. I'm sorry, that's what I meant to say. But you have all kind of different relationships and we have something that's a little more complex than a food chain and we call that a food web. All right, food webs are models that are used to describe all the possible feeding relationships among animals. So it's not just this simple um, one chain type thing. There are many different relationships that we can have um, and we are looking at all of the different feeding relationships among animals. These are more realistic than food chains because they show how animals rely on more than one type of food. Question? Have you ever seen that video where there was a snake that ate a hippo? A snake that ate a hippo? Yeah, there's a, there's a video. Oh. On YouTube? I think it's on YouTube. Right now. Wow, that is amazing. I have not seen that. I haven't seen that, but once we get through this, we're going to look on YouTube and see if we can find that video. That is, oh, is it pretty, yeah. Yeah, I haven't found that either. Okay, but we're going to see what we can find, and then we'll look at that. So here we're looking at a represent an example of a food web. Here is looking specifically at Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay water bird food web. All right, so we have all these different birds and so on, and you can see there's a number of different relationships, feeding relationships, and... Um, this bird, for example, can eat this small fish, um, which can also be eat, eaten by these other types of birds and so on. So it's not just one simple step-by-step -step process. It's this web of relationships, and that's a more accurate portrayal of what we see in nature. All right, so these ecological pyramids. An ecological pyramid is a model that is used to show the distribution of matter and energy in a, an ecological system. There should be a picture on here, and I had to get a picture and put it in there, and I didn't get it. So you have a blank spot in your handout. Um, but we're talking about a pyramid. It's showing now the distribution of matter and energy in an ecological system. Autotrophs are going to be at the bottom and followed by heterotrophs as you move up. Now I want to, we passed over a slide that I want to go back to, so give me. All right, here, this is what we're talking about in terms of at the bottom of the um, pyramid, we have producers because they are the ones that get energy directly from the sun. Then we have consumers, but here we have the primary consumers, okay, that's the first level. And then we have the consumers that eat the primary consumers, so the secondary consumers, and as we go all the way to the top, we're going to get the top carnivores. We are starting with the producers at the bottom, and then we go one step up, we get consumers that eat those producers. Those are the primary consumers, and we have the secondary consumers, and then we go all the way to the top with the top carnivores. All right, let's go back to where we were. Let's talk about cycles in nature. This is the last topic. There's a law in science. There's a law in science that says that matter can never be created nor destroyed. The stuff that we see comes from stuff that was already there. Matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So in other words, the atoms that make up the nutrients we need to live must be recycled. And we're going to go through some of these cycles and we're going to see some of the cycles that we have in nature. We're not going to go, with all, go through all of them, but we're going to take two examples and look at that, two or three, and look at those examples. Yes? So a tree that doesn't like 
create that, it just throws some like loose leaves in the ground. Very good question. Let's say we have a tree. Okay, a tree that is, and we're going to talk about this more when we talk when we talk about photosynthesis. This question is: a tree doesn't just create matter; it gets really huge. Where does all that stuff come from? So now I'm asking you guys that question: Where does all that stuff come from? The sun. The sun? Okay. So the sun has to do with it. That's where it gets its energy from. But where does it get all the matter from? What do trees need in order to survive? Okay. Water, nutrients in the soil. What else? Sun. What else? Do they need anything from us? Carbon dioxide, right? So we're breathing out carbon dioxide. And this, this concept sometimes is hard to get, and we're going to talk about it a little later on. But we're breathing out carbon dioxide. In that, we have carbon atoms. And trees are able to take those carbon atoms and, and make actual matter out of it with the energy that they're getting from the sun, with the water that, that they're getting, and they're combining that to form those huge masses. No, it's not. It's getting it from matter from us and from the water. It's actually taking that and putting it together, compacting it. There's chemical reactions that are happening in photosynthesis that actually make stuff from material that's already there. All right, if you're making a car, you can't just make a car out of nothing. You need to take little pieces from here, little pieces from here, combine them together and do all these things, and then you eventually have a car. And that's exactly what a tree does. It takes the water, it takes our carbon dioxide, um, it takes energy from the sun, it does chemical reactions, puts stuff together, and builds stuff based on what it's getting. Does that make sense? It doesn't create. Nothing is created or destroyed based on this law of science, all right? Everything that we have is stuff that we've always had. So there's this recycling process that continues going on. Does that make sense? Okay, and when we get to plants and photosynthesis and all that stuff, we'll talk a little more about how that happens and you'll see the details of that. Question? Is that what happens to us too? What happens to us? Or how we grow. Okay, how do we grow? Where are we getting the stuff from? Okay, we don't eat, we don't eat skin and, well, I mean, we don't eat human skin and human muscle or anything like that. We, we eat food and we break down that food and then we take that and then we repackage it um, to form what we need in order to grow. Yeah, so that's where we get our stuff from. And that's why we are consumers. We have to eat, take in the stuff, break it down, and form new stuff. So let's talk about the first cycle. The first cycle we're going to talk about is the water cycle. Since everything does not um, uh, just appear, we need to talk about how this water cycle works. There are a few terms that we need to know. Conden condensation. All right, you have, I used to think this all the time when I was younger. You have a really cold bottle of something, and then all of a sudden you have water around it. I used to think that it was sweating or something of the sort. Water is leaking through the little pores or something. I don't know why I thought that, but that's what I used to think. Um, but basically, what we're looking at in that, are you laughing at what I used to think? You guys never used to think really silly things? It's just me? Wow, I'm a weird person. All right, condensation is when water in the air, okay, there's air around us right now, and there's water vapor that's in the air. When water in the air condensates, condenses sorry, on an object cooler than the air, all right? So it comes in contact with a cooler object, and that water vapor then becomes liquid, and you see that condensation on that object. No, the object is not sweating like I used to think. Um, it's actually just condensing. Another term, evaporation. You take a pot of water, you put, it, you put a pot of water on the stove, you turn on the fire, uh, the burner, and the fire is on, what happens to the water? It boils, right? Um, but what happens if you forget the water on there? Has that ever happened to you guys? You forget the water, and then all of a sudden you come back and there's no water? Okay, that's because it all evaporates. Another term, precipitation. You guys should be very familiar with that living in Michigan. Um, we get a lot of that here, snow and so on. Woohoo, excited for snow, yay. All right, so rain, snow, and hail are good examples of precipitation. We're talking about water falling from the sky in different forms. 
Um, and transpiration, when we're talking about transpiration, we're talking about when water passes through plants into the air as water vapor. So this is evaporation, but specifically from plants, from the leaves of plants going into the air and so on and so forth. So these are the terms that I want you to know in the water cycle. And here is a figure, a picture that shows all, all these different things happening. So we have evaporation happening here. Um, in the oceans, water from the oceans that are evaporating and condensing up here and then that water also comes down as rain, as precipitation. Uh, you have water run, runoff going back into the ocean and you can see it's a cycle that's continuing over and over. We're not making new water when it's raining. Well, that's water that already went up from the oceans and rivers and lakes and so on that's now coming back down. So it's a cycle that continues on and on. All right, let's now talk about a different cycle. We're going to talk about the nitrogen cycle. Um, even though the air contains 78% nitrogen, okay, so we have 78% nitrogen in the air, uh, it's in a form that plants can't use directly. Okay, so the nitrogen in the air, plants cannot use this nitrogen in that form. So it needs to be converted. How does it get converted? Two things, lightning and bacteria. What's the two things? Lightning, lightning and bacteria. bacteria. Those can f convert the nitrogen in the air into a form that's more usable by the plants. Okay, so we have the nitrogen in the air, lightning happening, okay, and sometimes they wonder, oh, why is this lightning happening? What if someone gets electrocuted or something of that sort? The lightning is important. Because what it, what it does is it converts that nitrogen into a form so that plants can use it. Um, in some cases, we have situations where there's not enough nitrogen in the soil, so people use fertilizer. And one of the main components of that fertilizer would be nitrogen. So we're giving the plants nitrogen artificially, but so that the plant can use it and do what needs to be done. So here we're going to look at... Uh, an example uh, or a depiction of the nitrogen cycle. We have some plants. Uh, you can see the plants on the screen. Uh, there's atmospheric nitrogen in the air that gets converted. How does it get converted? Lightning, Lightning and bacteria. It converts it to a form that can be used by plants. And you see here and you don't need to know the, the, all of these details here, but you see the nitrogen here, it says N2. That's the form that it's in the air. These bacteria now can convert it to a different form um, that we call ammonium. And that ammonium is NH4+. Plus. You don't need to know that. Uh, but basically the main part, the main thing that you need to know here is that the at atmospheric nitrogen is being converted into a form that can be used now by the plants. All right, so we have this little bunny rabbit that comes, and the bunny rabbit does what? Okay, so it eats the plants. It eats the plants, and it gets nitrogen from that plant. Something happened, and the bunny rabbit is now dead. All right, so we have the rabbit that dies. Also, plants die. What happened when these dies? What feeds on them? Decomposers, good. All right, so that's going to, um, the decomposers are going to break down these parts of the organisms and convert it back into ammonium. Then we have some bacteria that basically can convert those back into a form that can be used by the plants and also bacteria that converts it back into the atmospheric nitrogen. So we have a cycle that's going. Nitrogen is starting here. Well, it's not really starting anywhere. It's just kind of continuing a cycle that basically makes it so that the plants can use the nitrogen, the animals can use the nitrogen, the bacteria can convert the nitrogen, gets back into a form that goes back into the air and so forth. So it's a cycle. Nothing is created or destroyed. Everything that we use, all the nutrients that we need is recycled. And that's, these are just two examples. That's the water cycle and a nitrogen cycle. That is the end of chapter two. That is all of the content that will be on the test, chapters one and two.